to criminal law one, constitutional due process, constitutional criminal procedure. Today, we are discussing one of my favorite subjects, uh, in fact, the one I'm writing a dissertation on, the exclusionary rule and entrapment. So let's jump in. So if you recall from our previous lectures, right, um, Miranda rights always apply to custodial interrogations, right? And we talked about what a custodial interrogation looks like. That being said, there is a public safety exception, right? So um, if the suspect is in custody and you interrogate them, um, you don't have to remind them of their rights, but their rights still do apply. Now, generally to trigger the public safety exception, as we discussed, three factors must be present. Police must have a reasonable belief that a threat is immediate. Questioning must be directed towards protecting public safety rather than establishing guilt or innocence. And the statements must not be the product of police compulsion that overcomes the suspect's will to resist. So any statements made to the police under the exception are admissible. However, Miranda must be read before questioning once the emergency has been resolved. Right, and so this is kind of what we talked about in, in the last, in part two of the lecture on interrogations. So let's talk about the exclusionary rule. What is it? Um, it basically pertains to evidence that has been obtained in violation of an individual's constitutional rights, right? If the police violate your constitutional rights in obtaining evidence, Unless there's an exception, it is generally inadmissible to establish the guilt in the prosecutor's case in chief. So case in chief just refers to uh, the prosecutor's first um, questioning, line, lines of questioning. Um, so yeah, if, if, if the um, police search your home without a warrant and there's no exception, and we've talked about the exceptions, and they find a big pile of drugs on your coffee table, well, generally speaking, that pile of drugs is inadmissible. And it's really hard to prove possession of drugs without even being able to reference the drugs, right? So when we're talking about the exclusionary rule, it is very, very um, intense, right? It, it's very important. Um, now, the purpose of the exclusionary rule is not to um, reward offenders, right? Uh, instead, it's to deter police misconduct. We'll talk a little bit about that more in a second. So the exclusionary rule in, not only includes what we call direct evidence, so the evidence that they seized or found because they violated your rights, but it also includes derivative evidence. Right, and that is evidence that was found because they found evidence when they violated your constitutional rights. All right, so police come in to your house, they find a big pile of drugs on your coffee table, and on top of it is a business card from the drug dealer that you got it from, um, as well as. Um, location of a warehouse where you're distributing the um, the drugs from. That information about that warehouse is considered derivative evidence, right? Because if they hadn't broken into your house, violated your constitutional rights, then they wouldn't have found the, co the cocaine, which is the direct evidence, and then they wouldn't have found the warehouse information, which is derivative evidence. And what we call derivative evidence, and you might hear this term used on TV, um, it's called fruit of the poisonous tree, right? And so the idea is basically up until a point, once you violate somebody's constitutional rights, anything that you get because of it is a violation of the constitution and is inadmissible, right? And again, it's highly contentious. Um, you have a lot of people, uh, that would really like to see it go away. Um, but the whole point here is to deter police misconduct, right? So the idea is 
police officers, you're spending, maybe you're spending a year building a case, right? Um, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of time. Uh, and suddenly, because you did not follow the rules, you didn't follow the law, you're a police officer who didn't follow the law, that evidence that you found, which was a slam dunk, is excluded from evidence. And again, if we're talking possession of drugs, it's almost impossible to prove possession of drugs without the drugs. So that means the case will get dismissed, right? So because you broke the law, somebody who is potentially guilty has gone free, right? And that includes direct evidence and anything deemed fruit of the poisonous tree. Now, initially, this rule only applied to the federal government, right? So if you take a look at Weeks v. United States, 1914, um, it, it, it's a case that, that, that deals with basically lying to customs about the number of glass panes um, in a shipment. It's this kind of like weird one-off case. Um, and this is where the Supreme Court officially articulates the exclusionary rule. Now, that being said, if we jump forward in time, even though the Fourth Amendment was incorporated by the 14th Amendment um, in Wolf v. Colorado, um, some problems come up. Right. So 14th Amendment basically said, OK, and Wolfie, Colorado, this applies to the states as well. Right. So if state law enforcement violates your rights, then we still throw it out the evidence. So police officers were not happy about this. Um, and it's again, it was very contentious. So police officers tried to find a way around it. So what happens is um, federal law enforcement replies upon what's called the silver platter doctrine um, until it was deemed unconstitutional, right? So the silver platter doctrine um, is basically this notion that, okay, if state law enforcement violates your rights, your constitutional rights, uh, that evidence can't come in against you at the state level. But remember, the federal government is a separate sovereign. So you could give the evidence over to the feds and have them prosecute the case. And because the feds did not violate your rights, then um, it was admissible, right? So it was the silver platter doctrine, basically state police violating rights and serving them up to the feds on a silver platter. Uh, this practice lasted about 12 years until it was declared unconstitutional in Elkins v. United States in 1960. Again, we're starting the criminal justice revolution at this point. Yet the states continued to be exempt from the exclusionary rule completely um, until Map v. Ohio in 1961, right? And so that's the case that I have you all turn in today. Um, Matt v. Ohio is a really interesting case. It's a really good read um, if you have the stories of criminal procedure. It's a really, really interesting case um, because basically like, police come up and, and want to come into this lady's house and she's like, no. And so like they hang out on her front lawn for a couple of hours and then they come back and they say, ah, we have a warrant. And they kind of kick, bust down to the door and she goes, let me see it. And they won't show it to her. So she grabs it and she sticks the warrant in her bra. And police retrieve the warrant, which always like, I always wondered like who had that job, right? Of like, get it. Um, but they retrieve the warrant and she sees that it, it's fake, right? It's a fake warrant, it's, it's not real. It's, it's completely made up. So the police search and they find some issues related to obscenity in the house. Um, Map is arrested, charged, convicted, and the states and the, and, and the Supreme Court said, okay, the exclusionary rule 
now applies to the states. Um, since you violated the constitutional rights, anything that you found because you violated the rights is now out of evidence, right? And so they reverse and they remand. So Wolf v. United, or Wolf v. Colorado incorporates the 14th Amendment, or by the 14th Amendment, incorporates the Fourth Amendment. But it doesn't get specific as to um, the exclusionary rule until Matt v. Ohio, right? And this is where we say, yes, it applies to the states. States, no, you cannot get away with it. So there is a lot of interesting case law on point regarding what's called standing to challenge the evidence. So standing just means that it is your lawful right to challenge the evidence, right? You have, it, it's you, it's about you. So I will let you all read these in your own time, but we'll kind of go over some of them. Um, Alderman v. United States, 1969 case. It's a really good introduction to what standing is, right? And the idea is your constitutional rights have to be violated, right? That's what standing is, is, is your personal constitutional rights have to be violated. Now, my dissertation, I'm arguing against that, saying you should be able to articulate what's called target standing. Um, when, and we'll look at United States versus Painter in a minute, um, what target standing is this notion that we violate somebody's rights, right, like a third party's rights, we don't arrest the third party because we know it can't come into evidence, but we get evidence on you. And then we get a search warrant and search your house and arrest you. Well, we haven't violated your constitutional rights. We violated the constitutional rights of somebody else, right? And so that's what you actually see in, in, in Ruckus, right? Um, deals with autom automobile exclusion. Um, and it's this notion that, uh, if your rights aren't violated, you cannot assert the rights of somebody else. Uh, we move down to Minnesota v. Olson, which is a apparently a future case. Um, uh, no, it's it's a 1990 case, and it deals with overnight guests, right? So, um, kind of the question came up here: is if police come and knocking down a door and you have somebody staying overnight and they search that person and whatnot, um, does that person have the right to sue for violation of their constitutional rights um, because they were in the house? Um, generally speaking, this turns on a question of um, their expectation of privacy, right? And remember, we've talked about this in pretty lengthy detail that when we think about the expectation of privacy, it has to meet both a subjective and objective standard. Subjectively, the person has to believe they have the right to privacy. And objectively, we have to, as a society, say that is a valid belief, right? And so overnight guests become problematic because they're staying there, right, in somebody's home. So they don't have as much of an expectation of privacy but they probably have some, right? The, the, the bare minimum expectation of privacy. So when the police violate the rights of the homeowners, they could in turn be violating the rights of any overnight guests um, who have that expectation of privacy. So read Minnesota versus Olson, it comes to a very interesting conclusion. Um, one that I, I think is, is definitely controversial, um, but makes sense given the context. Uh, this also comes true in Rawlings v. Kentucky, which is a 1980 case. So this deals with possessory interest in items that are seized, right? So let's say um, police can violate your, they, 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 they come into your, your best friend's house and they file and they find a pile of drugs that belong to you that you just left over there. 
Well, they violated your friend's rights by coming in, so they can't use the evidence against your friend. But can they use it against you? Because you have a possessory interest in the item seized, right? It's a part of your possession. And we look at possession, and, and possession is, an, is a whole different ballpark. Uh, we talk about the elements of possession and what it requires in criminal law, too. But take a look at this case. Again, it comes to a very interesting conclusion. Um, one that you might think, oh, wow, really? Um, even when I first read it, that was my first reaction. Also take a look at Minnesota v. Carter. This deals with commercial transactions, um, violating the rights of basically corporate entities. Um, how does that play out? And then look at United States versus Painter, 1980 case. And again, this deals with the target of a police investigation. So this deals with target standing, much like Raucus did. Um, so I encourage you to look at each of these cases and read through them, um, not only for the holding and what they mean, but the stories behind them are awesome. Um, like they're the craziest stories that you wouldn't think would happen, right? Um, like they're flukes. And that's why it gets to the Supreme Court is because they're a novel challenge, right? And, and how do we deal with this? Uh, so definitely take a look at these cases, um, know them for the exam. Um, and one thing that I encourage you to also do is look at a motion to suppress. So I will pull that up here now. Um, looks like I didn't upload it yet. Uh, what I'll do is it's this afternoon, I will upload a sample motion to suppress so you can see what it looks like. Um, the, the sample motion is a motion that I wrote. Uh, it deals with um, this idea of target standing, right? Violating somebody else's rights to get to your rights. Um, it's ultimately uh, a motion that uh, was unsuccessful um, because it's just how the law was. But, and here's the big but, um, this is what my dissertation is basically coming from, is I'm angry that this was uh, a ineffective motion to suppress, and I believe the court was wrong, and as soon as my dissertation gets approved and I go through um, the, the chair and, and all that jazz, I'm gonna send it to the judge just to be like, see, I was right. Um, is it vindictive and petty? Absolutely, but you know, stuff happens. So that being said, there are exceptions to the exclusionary rule, right? So the first is collateral proceedings and rebuttal cases, right? So a collateral proceeding is basically anything that does not, it's not the trial, right? So collateral proceeding could be an arraignment. Um, it could be a preliminary hearing, you name it. The information about the, let's say, seized drugs can come in, right? Because it's not determining guilt or innocence. In fact, if you do a motion to suppress, you are basically saying, yeah, those drugs were mine, but they were obtained illegally. And right? we don't use that against you, but you can use drugs in collateral proceedings. And this does also include sentencing um, if the case is ultimately successful. We also have exceptions in rebuttal cases, right? So a rebuttal case is if the defense opens the door to the use of drugs. Right. And so you have the defendant on the stand, which again is a horrible idea, and I'd never recommend. But you have the defendant on the stand, and um, you ask the defendant, um, you've never used drugs before, right? And you've never you've never possessed drugs, have you? No. There's no there's never been drugs in your house. No. Well, you've just opened the door because we want to protect against perjury, right? You have just perjured yourself because you think, well, if they can't use it against me, 
then I can say that, yeah, I've never had drugs in my house. And what happens is the prosecutor then gets an opportunity to bring in the drugs. But the jury is instructed that they are only allowed to consider the drugs regarding the credibility of the defendant and not for the fact that they found drugs. So if you're going, what the hell? Y yeah, it, it is a what the hell thing. Um, basically, it, it's a kind of a, a workaround where defense opens the door, prosecutors can walk through it, right? And again, it can only be used to determine somebody's validity or credibility. It's not supposed to be considered by jurors in terms of the actual crime. Now, do jurors consider it a part of the crime? Absolutely, right? Because if you say, yeah, I've never had drugs in my apartment before, and the prosecutor gets up there and, and says, well, didn't police find drugs in your apartment? Guess what? Like you're, you're getting convicted. Um, so again, that's another reason why we don't put defendants on the stand. In addition, we have other exceptions. Um, one is attenuation. So basically, it's attenuation that removes the quote taint. Um, and, and what we mean by taint is the illegal activity that the police engaged in violating constitutional rights. So attenuation that removes the egregiousness of the violation of your rights. Now, this is very, very, very important in fruit of the poisonous tree arguments, right? Because the more attenuated something is, the more likely we are to say that can come into evidence. The less attenuated that something is from a constitutional violation, the more likely we are to say that cannot come into evidence, All right? So take a look at the case U.S. v. Boone. It's a Tenth Circuit case from 1995 and it deals with attenuation. Now, that being said, when we consider removing the taint, um, we have various factors that we have to include, right? So first is temporal proximity. So you find, you find the drugs on, on a coffee table and with a little sign that says, I'm a distributor and the rest of my drugs are in this warehouse, right? Now, if police like go immediately to that warehouse and um, they search it, then we're probably gonna say, like, well, that's really close. Like the only reason that you knew about the warehouse, found out about the warehouse um, is because you broke the law. You, you violated somebody's constitutional rights. However, if police wait three months and then um, search the warehouse, then we might say the taint has been removed, right? Because theoretically in those three months, what could you have done? You could have moved the drugs, you could have done a whole lot of things that you just didn't do. So that's where that kind of comes into play. Um, we also look at any intervening circumstances, right? So is there something else that comes up um, that removes the taint? Um, so we think of like intervening circumstances, uh, we can think um, they violate your rights, but halfway through before they get upstairs, they get a, the police get a search warrant and then they find your drugs or whatever upstairs. Well, is that an intervening circumstance? Yeah, so probably the stuff they found downstairs can't come in against you, but they have the warrant upstairs, right? That's an intervening circumstance. Another is uh, basically if, um, if the police would have found the drugs or if would have found it um, anyway, um, right, via a different channel of evidence. So the police would have found the drugs via um, uh, something else that happened in the case, right? We talked about inevitable discovery. 
that comes into play as well. We also look at the intent of the police officers, right? When we're saying, how far does this taint extend? Did the police officers intentionally violate your rights? Right? Did they knowingly violate your rights? Or did they think maybe they had a warrant when really they didn't? Um, so it was more of an accident to violate your rights. It wasn't like they were trying to. Well, that's going to be a little bit different, right? Um, because uh, we're trying to, excuse me, uh, because we're trying to deter police misconduct, right? And so if something is un, an unintentional violation, well, then there's nothing to deter, right? Because it, it was unintentional. So we're still going to say that the evidence you find primarily, uh, direct evidence, is going to be excluded, but derivative evidence, right, um, may be excluded just depending on the factors of the totality of the circumstances. We also look at what your constitutionally protected interest was, right? So again, I encourage you to read Hudson v. Michigan. It's a 2006 case, and it deals with what 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 was the violation, right? Did they break into your home? Did they pull you over and incorrectly? Uh, you know, what, what right have they violated? And then we also look at subsequent retrieval of testimony versus physical evidence, right? And so um, this long story short is, is, is just, um, if somebody can testify that you had the drugs or something along those lines, um, then they're able to, right? Even if the prosecution can't enter the drugs in, if somebody else can testify that you did have drugs on your coffee table, like your, your best friend racked you out or something like that, um, then that can come in, right? Because it's testimonial, it's not the physical evidence. So you can, you can still prove drugs um, via protected entry or via uh, testimony, even when you don't have the physical evidence necessary. So we also have another fun exception, the good faith exception, right? So what this is, is police, a, objectively police have a reasonable belief that their search is legal, right? So they have an objectively reasonable belief. Again, the whole point of the exclusionary rule is to deter mis police misconduct. So if we require that if somebody has good faith belief that the warrant they were relying upon was good or something else, and we'll talk about the other else, then we're probably going to say that can come into evidence because it wasn't a violation. Um, if it doesn't come into evidence, direct evidence, the derivative evidence will. Um, again, and it's just because you, of, of, of how this plays out. Um, so that being said, there are numerous ways to establish good faith. And this is so far because they are continuing. So you have a reliance on a warrant. This is the United States v. Leon, 1984. And it turns out that warrant was invalidated or maybe had a wrong apartment number or something like that. We're going to say, no, that evidence has come in. That they were relying on what they thought was a valid warrant when actually it wasn't. Um, and they didn't know that it wasn't valid. They legitimately thought it was valid. So we're not gonna punish them because the, there's nothing to punish, right? We can't deter accidents. We also look at reliances on assurances by the judge. This is in Massachusetts v. Shepard. So if the judge says, oh yeah, I'll sign the warrant, I'll write the warrant out, and the judge just forgets to do it, um, the police can and the prosecutor can come in and say, look, the judge told him they would have a warrant that they could go ahead and search and he just forgot. So the police didn't do anything wrong and the judge just forgot. Um, you know, there's nothing to deter here. So 
we should um, allow it to come into evidence. We also talk about reliance on legislation, which is Illinois v. Curl, um, or Curl. Um, this deals with police officers relying upon and interpreting what Congress has said, whether state legislature has said in terms of being able to search. Now, if you rely on that legislation and that legislation turns out to be unconstitutional, we're still gonna allow the evidence to come in because you relied on what was technically law at the time. We also say if you rely on data from a court employee, that it's good faith, right? So again, this is similar to uh, assurances by the judge. This is the court clerk says, oh yeah, uh, I just saw the, the search warrant. Uh, you have it, you're good to go. And maybe it wasn't signed. Or the court employee says, uh, you have to search apartment 12, um, when really it was apartment 13, right? they're getting their information from a court employee. And so the idea here is they're still using the system that they are supposed to use, right? They are going through the court system like they're supposed to. And it's not their fault and there's nothing to deter if they're relying on somebody who's employed by the court in a position that can make assurances. We also look at reliance on apparent third party consent so this is Illinois versus Rodriguez. Um, it's a 1990 case. So this is kind of this notion of somebody who didn't necessarily have the ability to consent, did they consent, right? And you had no reason to believe that they didn't have the ability to consent to a search. Maybe it wasn't their home, um, but you have that reasonable belief. We're gonna say anything that they find because they lie and they say, yeah, I'm the homeowner or something along those lines, anything they find we're gonna say is, 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 is admissible because again, they weren't breaking the law, right? They were just asking if they could search. So there's nothing to deter. And they also rely on precedent that is overturned, right? So let's say it's, it's much like legislation, right? There's something that comes out, um, it's a case and it says, you can search people's houses without warrants, whenever you want. And the court says this. Well, that's gonna to go to the Supreme Court, no question, right? Uh, but in that interim, you start conducting searches without a warrant. And then that case gets struck down and overturned, right? And now the, the law is bad law. Well, during the time that you did it, you were relying on precedent that was valid. So just because it gets overturned later doesn't mean that you did anything wrong, right? And that's the thing that you have to keep in mind with these good faith exceptions is we're trying to um, stop police from violating the rights of others intentionally, right? So all these examples, we're, and, and including Herring, we're going through and we're saying, look, is this going to deter police misconduct or were they doing the right thing or did they think they were doing the right thing or did the legislature or the court say they had the right thing and they didn't, All right? So good faith is always a problem. Um, defense attorneys hate this exception, right? Like I hate the exception, but I understand it because the whole point of the exclusionary rule, again, is to deter police misconduct. And if police haven't committed misconduct, then there's nothing to deter. And I don't think the evidence should be permitted, but my opinion doesn't count for much because the courts will allow that evidence to come in. So we have even more exceptions to the exclusionary rule. Uh, the first is the independent source doctrine. This is Nix v. Williams, 1984 case. So basically if police have a, a separate from the, the illegal conduct. If they have a separate source um, that would have that would have given them probable cause um, to conduct a search, right, an independent source, uh, something like snitch, um, 
then we're going to say that that exception applies, right? That, um, yeah, you violated the constitutional rights, but during the process, before you, you, you went into the house without a warrant, you were told by a reliable informant that they were holding some people hostage. Well, that's an independent source, right? So you might not have the evidence on your, by yourself to go search the home, but if an independent source verifies it before you do the search, then or while you're doing the search or after, um, then we're going to say there's an independent source, right? Uh, we also have the inevitable discovery rule. So this is what we talked about when talking about searches: the reason police impound vehicles when they do inventory searches. Because let's say, and this is on Nick v. Williams as well, let's say that police um, stop somebody for uh, drunk driving, right? And as it turns out, they were just, they were targeting somebody, person wasn't drunk, anything along those lines, but they had the car towed, right? And as the person's getting questioned and booked and stuff like that, police go through the car and police find um, drugs. The question then becomes, is it inevitable discovery? Um, if it's just the they are targeting somebody, well then, no, it wouldn't be inevitable. Um, but if they had reason to pull you over and then they could tow your vehicle, but the reason they pulled you over was unconstitutional, but they towed your vehicle and they were gonna find it anyway, then we're gonna allow it to come in, right? So. It's like the police officer does something wrong to pull you over and looks, shines, shines his flashlight around your car, opens the glove compartment, finds drugs, drug paraphernalia, right? Um, that car was going to be towed and it was going to be searched anyway. So the fact that he violated your rights in the search, we say, well, they were going to find it anyway. Um, because they're doing an inventory search. I don't like this rule um, because it can be one, confusing, but um, two, it can be um, really problematic in, in terms of when did you violate, when would you really have discovered this regardless, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, All right? So this kind of like looks at the case in hindsight it says, okay, you did this, this, and this, but this and this apply, and yada, yada, yada. Um, and then again, impeachment evidence. So this is what we talked about a little bit ago. The ultimate goal in the court is to prevent perjury. So if we try to impeach the witness, right, on the rebuttal case, um, we can say, well, didn't the police find drugs in your home? Well, yeah. This is given with what's called a limiting instruction. So the judge tells the jury, you can only consider the drugs in this case when determining the credibility of the defendant, but you cannot use the drugs as evidence of the possession of drugs. Now, that's great but you can never unring a bell, right? So the jury's already heard this, like, yeah, you had drugs, we just we couldn't bring it up. Well, they're gonna get to the jury room and, and realistically, they're not gonna follow the judge, right? They're just gonna say, well, um, well, he did have drugs, he admitted to it, so I guess he's guilty. Um, unless you have some lawyer in there, which you'd never have a lawyer on a jury, say, no, we can't consider it, it, it doesn't exist. I mean, it does, right? Again, you can't unring the bell. So that being said, uh, two cases I really want you to look at are Walter v. United States. This deals with excluded drugs. And then Harris v. New York. This deals with non Mirandi statements. Again, all coming into play in terms of impeachment evidence. So let's shift gears here just a little bit and look at entrapment, right? So 
Prior to Sorellas v. United States, a 1932 case, police could conceive of, plan, and procure the commission of a crime, right? Um, so they could do whatever they wanted, basically, to get somebody to commit a crime. 1932, this changes. But before it, and the best way I can think about it is, let's say you are um, like the perfect nuclear family, right? Uh, you, you have, uh, uh, a, a, let's say it's the, the traditional nuclear family. Uh, let's say you have a father, right? He's married to your mother and they've been married for decades. Um, your dad is a great guy and he does great things. And your mom is a stay-at-home mom, but she makes everything special for you, right? She cuts the, the, the crusts off your bread, makes you lunches. Um, you have either two brothers or two sisters, whatever. Um, so there's four of you and you get along really well and you both are raised very well. Um, and let's say that like, you're also super religious. Um, Let's say that for argument's sake, you are, um, I don't know, I don't know anything about them, but let's say Lutherans, right? I don't know anything about them, um, but we're just going to pick on them. Nothing against them or anything like that. It's just a random religion that I picked. Um, so you're sitting home for dinner, right? At dinner. And mom has prepared this awesome gourmet dinner. And dad says, you know, let us pray. And then they, they would pray. And then um, they go around the table and dad's like, hey, I want to know about your day. What all did you do today? And he looks over to his, the, the, the son and the son says, well, golly gee, dad, it was a rough day, but I'm really thankful that we have a family. God has really blessed us. Well, yes, they have son. Yes, he has. Right? I'm, I'm sorry you had a rough day, but I'm glad that you're looking at it positively. And then they hear a knock on the door. And the father goes, golly gee, I wonder who that could be. I don't want to get up from the table, but I also don't want to be rude. So please excuse me while I, I see who this is. And you go to the door and a man is standing outside. All right. And he says he's been going door to door selling um, methamphetamines, right? And, and your first reaction, and he asks you if you want to buy some, right? You're the dad. Your first reaction is, no, I don't want to buy any drugs. That's wrong. Right? That, that's bad. That's a no-no. And the drug dealer starts saying, no, actually... It will bring your family closer together, right? If you all do meth, you'll be very close, right? Um, and, um, you know, even more religious than you were before. And the dad pauses and says, so it's going to bring my family closer together and make us better people if we all do methamphetamine? And the drug dealer says, yes. And the father reluctantly says, well, since it's going to help the family, I'll deal the drug, or I'll, I'll take I'll take a a, a a a dime bag or whatever you call them um, of the drugs, so that my family can be close together. At that point, the person at the front door pulls out a badge, and shows you that they are police. Now, prior to 1932, you could be arrested. Right, so just as police cannot coerce a confession, they cannot coerce a crime. What this is, is entrapment, right? So basically the government induces an otherwise innocent individual to commit a crime, right? So basically the idea is, um, the person would, would not have committed the crime but for the actions of police, right? So remember in our example, dad originally said, well, golly gee, no. And then the drug dealer kept pushing and pushing and lying and, and, and basically 
knowing what the father needed to hear in order to buy the drugs, tells the father, right? And reluctantly, the father says, okay, that's entrapment, right? Because the father is theoretically otherwise innocent, right? The father hasn't gone and sought things out, doesn't have a history or anything along those lines, right? Completely innocent. Um, that's entrapment, right? Lo and behold. So this does include undercover agents, confidential informants, and private citizens acting under the direction of law enforcement. So if, the, let's say the drug dealer was a legitimate drug dealer, um, didn't have a badge or anything, it was a legitimate drug dealer, and entrapped you into buying the drugs, that evidence cannot be used against you. It's excluded. It's entrapment. Right, so there was um, a story that my father told me, which was he, he heard it in Colorado. So, man, this is like a third hand story. Um, but basically, what happened is there's a, there was a bar in this small town, right? And there was only like one bar. And it was small, but it wasn't like everybody knows everyone's small. But that being said, bartender is tending bar and a sheriff walks in full uniform and he walks in holding hands or arm in arm with a young lady right and under law they have the bartender has to card anyone who looks under 50 right the sheriff obviously is over 21 so they sit down at the bar, the sheriff and his, and his companion. Bartender comes over and says, hey, how can I help you? And the sheriff orders his drink and bartender says, great. And then the female companion orders her drink. Bartender says, great. But first, can I see your ID? And then the sheriff throws a fit, right? Like, what do you mean? You don't believe she's 21? She, of course she's 21 i can vouch for that i mean throws is like really really long large fit and so the uh, the the bartender finally you know he keeps he asks like three or four times and then finally because the sheriff is like threatening to arrest him he makes the female companion her drink upon giving her her drink the sheriff pulls out a ticket pad and writes up a citation um, of the bartender for serving somebody who's under 21 years of age, right? And so this actually went to trial. It should have never gone to trial um, because it was clearly law enforcement induced this other innocent person who had no inclination to commit a crime, was trying to do the right thing, and the officer basically forced it to happen. Ultimately, the, 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 the bartender was found not guilty, um, but it should have never gone to that point. But that, that's just, that's a real story about entrapment. Um, that does happen, all right? Now, the thing about entrapment is it's called, it is what we call an affirmative defense to criminal charges. Um, in affirmative defense basically says, Yes, I committed the crime, comma, but, all right? And so usually we're talking low-level cases uh, like prostitution, um, illegal sale of what we call vice items and materials, so basically drugs, um, and things like public corruption, right? Um, it's very unlikely that Entrapment would ever apply to a serious member mound and say crime, such as homicide, right? Because again, we're talking usually low level crimes where the police can make arrests, right? They, they, they go undercover or they have an informant and they do low, low level stuff, right? Um, it's doubtful that the police would ever have somebody talk you into or convince you to murder someone. Um, like, could it happen? Like, technically, yeah, but is it likely? No. Um, again, we're talking relatively low-level cases. 
um, usually vice cases. That being said, since it's an affirmative defense, it changes the burden of proof from the prosecution to the defendant. And generally speaking, the defendant has to prove, not by reasonable doubt, but by 50% in a feather, or 50.01, or 51%, however you want to look at it, um, has to prove that they were innocent and the only reason they engaged in the crime is because of the law enforcement officer or confidential informant or private citizen acting under the direction of law enforcement. Right, so this is an interesting case or interesting defense because it raises questions, right? Um, how does this deal with the uh, undercover operations, right? When is going undercover too far? Um, so you, you can think about like a, a I mean, the, 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 they're what's called red light districts, right? And they're, and they're in every city. And it's basically usually a, a area where, where prostitutes walk around, a car pulls over, the prostitutes get in the car, the car drives to a location, things happen, and then the car returns the prostitute back to his or her um, place that they were before, right? In the Paisen lobby set. Now, that's something that a police have really kind of targeted, um, especially in the 1980s, 1990s, and even into the 2000s, uh, is prostitution. Um, so what they might do is they say, okay, maybe we'll do undercover, right? This way we can bust a bunch of people for um, either hiring, I guess you could say, a prostitute or being in prostitution. So they decide that they are going to try to go after the Johns, right? They're going to go after the people who are seeking out the prostitutes. And so they take a very attractive female officer. They dress her in skippy clothing. And they have her walk up and down the red light district, right? But unlike other prostitutes, this one flags down cars, like flags them down, waves her arm, gets them to come over. Um, and then says, well, you know, hey, if you have like $5, I can make your night. Um, and the person's kind of like, eh, that's illegal, but that's yeah, a good deal. Like, okay, fine. And then as soon as he says, okay, fine, the undercover agent pulls out a badge and they arrest the John, right? And then they charge him with solicitation of prostitution. Now, in that case, has the undercover operation gone too far? Um, and the answer is probably, right? Just because somebody is driving down a street doesn't make them look like they're trying to engage uh, prostitutes. It's not like they would slow down every time they saw a woman and, and they just got flagged down and then they're like, okay, this one works. Like if they're just legitimately just driving down the street to get to another location and somebody's flagging them down like it's an emergency and they pull over and then you convince them to have sex for money, um, that's probably gonna be entrapment. Uh, if, however, the guy was slowing down every time he saw a woman, kind of pulling over, talking to him. Then he'd go down to the next one, talk to them. And then he comes to the undercover cop, talks to her, and, and he, he's like, well, you know, I'll pay you $50 if you, know, you have sex with me. And she says, okay, and then pulls out her badge and arrests him. Um, that's a lot different, right? Because in this case, he's not innocent. Right? We know what he was doing. We know what he was looking for. Right? You don't, it's not like he would just pull over, ask somebody for directions. You, you, maybe you do that once, but you don't do it three or four times in a row on a single street. Um, so we know what you're doing. You're not innocent. In that case, that would probably not be considered entrapment. But again, the burden of proof is on the defendant to prove that, but for, the officer's conduct, 
this otherwise innocent individual would not have committed the crime, right? So uh, it's, it's difficult to prove, very difficult to prove, but it has come up and it has affected significantly undercover operations. So if you're thinking about going into policing or even the thing about going to law school, if you have an undercover operation, this should pop into your mind immediately. How do we do this without making it entrapment? So how do we determine whether or not something is entrapment? Um, in developing a legal test to regulate entrapment, uh, Chief Justice Earl Warren, so this is during the criminal justice revolution, right? And he's my favorite justice. In Sherman v. United States, it's a 1958 case, noted, quote, a line must be drawn between the trap for the unwary innocent and the trap for the unwary criminal. So what happens is in Sherman, the court unanimously agrees that the defendant had been entrapped, um, but disagreed on the test for entrapment. Thus, we have two separate tests for entrapment. So we have the subjective test for entrapment and the objective test for entrapment. So five of the nine justices in Sherman advocated for the subjective test for entrapment, right? So the idea here is what was that person thinking? Was that person just an unwary criminal? Like what, 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 what they were doing and they just kind of like went to the wrong person um, or did subjectively the person did not want to engage in a crime, but subjectively when law enforcement was involved, did engage in the crime. Um, so five of the, the, the nine used that as their argument. And in today's, in, in society um, today, we it is used by the federal government, right? So it's used for, by the feds, the subjective test, where we look at the individual. And it's also used by the majority of the states. Right? So the subjective test is, is kind of your, your, your best bet. But remember, there were two tests that were created. The other is the ob objective test for entrapment. Right? And then this is advocated by four justices. And this says, okay, looking at everything we know, um, not looking at this person's mindset, but looking at their actions, looking at what um, any other reasonable person would do, would this be entrapment, right? It, any other reasonable person, um, would it be entrapment? And if the answer is yes, then it's entrapment and, and it, basically the case gets thrown out. Now, what's really difficult about the subjective and objective test is it's a five to four decision, right? So five justices say subjective, four justices say objective. Now, the objective test is used by the model penal code and a minority of the states. Right, because it's it's really hard to say. Well, what would a otherwise reasonable person do? That's not really. I mean, that's hard to. Uh, that's almost impossible to prove. But if you have the duty to prove that you were innocent, and you only committed the crime because law enforcement made you, you're going to be able to probably prove that more if we use the subjective test, right? Um, if you're, because you have the burden of proof because this is a affirmative defense. So when we look at the subjective test, right? Guess what? We break it down. Um, the subjective test focuses again on whether the defendant possessed the criminal intent or predisposition to commit the crime or whether the government created it. So what do we do? Step one is to determine whether the government induced the crime. Right? So we look to see if there's persuasion or pressure. Right? Um, a simple offer is not sufficient. Right? So a simple offer, like the, we had the drug dealer that was going door to door and goes to dad and dad and, 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 and just says, hey, would you like to buy some drugs? And the dad otherwise wouldn't, was would just kind of on a hunch. Was, yeah, yeah, that's fine. We're going to say that's not sufficient. Right? But when the 
drug dealer starts talking them into it and fighting them about it, then we are moving from an offer to persuasion or pressure. Now, this often will appeal to friendships, compassion, false promises of material or sexual gain, assistance, etc. Right? So this is where we see um, step one of the subjective test. We see it when we're talking about law enforcement appeals to somebody's friendship or they have an informant appealing on their friendship, right? Going beyond an offer, this persuasion, if your friend tells you to do something, then you're like, well, that's, that's a little different. Or compassion, like you need to do this. Like my kids are starving and, um, you know, I'll have sex with you if you can buy them food. Like that's compassion, false promises. Of, like, well, you'll get money or you'll get sex, whatever. Um, that can be oftentimes persuasion or pressure and not just simply an offer. So if we say that step one, that the government induced the crime, if we say no, that's where the subjective test ends, right? And the person is guilty. If we say yes, then we move to step two, where we determine whether the defendant possessed the, and this is important, predisposition or readiness to commit the crime. And how do we do this? We assess a number of characteristics and a number of things. Uh, first is the character or reputation of the defendant, including prior arrests for the type of crime involved. Right, so if it's the red light district, and a guy has had two, got caught twice for having sex with a prostitute, um, and they're slowing down and talking to women, we can probably say, yeah, they weren't innocent, right? Yeah, maybe law enforcement talked them into it, but they had the predisposition or readiness to engage in it. That's what they were trying to do. Um, if, however, it's somebody like, I don't know, the Pope, right? And the Pope is driving in the boatmobile down the road and stops. That changes things, right? Because we're talking about character or reputation. Um, so the Pope probably doesn't have arrest records for prostitution or anything like that. Probably is deemed a very good character, very good reputation, etc. So we're going to say that person's probably not predisposed to readiness or uh, the for the crime. We also looked at whether the government or the defendant first suggested the activity, right? So let's say you were on the red light district, you pulled, you pull over to the, to one woman and she's a, a undercover agent and you say, Hey ma'am, I'm sorry. Um, can you, um, can you give me directions? I legitimately lost. Um, I'm trying to get to my friend's house, which is on um, West main street can you tell me how to get over to West Main Street? And then she says, I can do more than that, right? And then offers sexual activity and maybe pressures or persuades. Well, in this case, we're going to say, well, the defendant didn't suggest the activity, right? The defendant was just asking for directions. The person who suggested it was the undercover officer. Right. We also look to see whether the defendant was engaged in criminal activity for profit. Right. So was the defendant already engaged in criminal activity? And then you convince them to do more criminal activity. Um, we look at whether the defendant was reluctant to commit the offense. Right. So remember um, the, the Lutheran dad example. Right. Of, oh, golly, gee, no. Um, that's bad. Drugs are bad. Right, like that's reluctance, and you don't want to do it, but you do it. Um, and we also look at the attractiveness of the inducement, right? So, what were you going to stand to gain? Like, were you going to gain ten cents if you engaged in this crime, or were you going to gain ten thousand dollars? Right, ten cents is probably not as attractive of an inducement as ten thousand dollars is. Right, so if we can prove step one by, again, preponderance of the evidence, and step two by preponderance of the evidence, and then generally speaking, we're gonna say the person wasn't trapped, 
and the case is thrown out. Now let's look at the objective test. So the objective test focuses on the actions of the government rather than the character of the individual that would, come, that would overcome the will of those normally avoid crime. Um, so the objective test doesn't really provide clear guidelines to law enforcement, but instead it <laughs> articulates a incomplete, so this is still being added to, set of prohibited practices by the government, right? So this is an ongoing list and, it, and it's not really a full test in the sense of being a test. So the government is prohibited from one, taking advantage of weaknesses, right? So this would be inducing somebody that you know is a drug addict to buy drugs so that you can arrest them. You've just taken advantage of their weakness, right? We're going to say that's entrapment right off the bat, right? We don't care about the character of the defendant or anything like that. We're going to say that's entrapment. Uh, next thing that is prohibited is repeated appeals to friendship or sympathy. So you can appeal like once to, hey, we're friends or, you know, my kids really need this, but you can't do it more than once. If you do it more than once, then you are pressuring and persuading that person like to the point that it would overcome their will. Uh, promise substantial economic gain, right? So this is, if you um, commit this crime, you know, you're know you gonna get a million dollars. Somebody told me that, I'd go commit a crime, are you kidding me? Like, absolutely. Um, that's substantial economic gain, that's prohibited. If, however, the government promises in substantial economic gain, then that changes things. So if the, if the government's like, yeah, you'll, you know, you'll get like 20 bucks if you do this. I'm probably not going to do it. Right. Um, but there are a couple of things come into play. What is defined as substantial economic gain really depends upon um, the individual. Right. So if you're homeless, $20, you'll take it. Right? If you're Bill Gates, $20, you're not going to take it. And we also have to include into this, remember, taking advantage of weaknesses. So if we know somebody is hurting for money, right, um, then we will take advantage of their weakness and, and promise economic gain. Those are two prohibited defenses. Like we, You can't do that. You cannot use pressures or threats Right, so commit this crime or I'm going to kill your family. Like, you can't do that. Uh, providing um, equipment required for carrying out a crime. Uh, so they come over and like, hey, let's rob a bank. Um, you're going to need the gun. Here's the gun to rob the bank with. Um, we'll be waiting outside to, to, to flee. Well, we're going to say from the objective standard, we don't care if the defendant was like, yeah, awesome, I'm going to do this. Objectively, we said, no, you provided him something he needed to carry out the crime. You provided him the gun. So that's literally law enforcement provoking you and making you do something. Um, that being said, false representations that conduct is not criminal is also prohibited, right? So one that gets people a lot of trouble is Las Vegas, right? So... Las Vegas, everything's like in, in, in Las Vegas that prostitution is legal. It's not. Prostitution is legal in Nevada in two counties that are down in the southwestern corner of the state. And there's all kinds of licensing requirements and things like that. But people can get caught for getting, and this, this, this gets law enforcement into trouble a lot. Um, when they say they, 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 they're doing a prostitution sting and they say, oh, hey, this is Las Vegas. It's not criminal here. You know, it's legal to do this here. Well, the fact that law enforcement just said that it was legal, like that's basically overcoming the will. Like you're just like, oh, okay. Um, when in reality, everybody thinks it's legal in Las Vegas. It's only legal in, in, in a couple of counties. Um, that are not Las Vegas. So again, that provides kind of a, a, a context for 
objectively, what would overcome the will, right? And so we look at these, and again, this is a list that is still being added to because there's no step one, step two. It's like, take a look at these. If any of these occurred, then it is automatically um, entrapment and automatically we're talking dismissal of the case. Now, we have a third test. Um, the third test basically says if the subjective test or the objective test, which were articulated in Sherman, do not apply or are unfavorable, right? So maybe a predisposition does exist. A defendant may invoke the due process clause, the due process test for entrapment. So this is the third test, All right? So if the first two aren't in your favor, pull up due process test, right? It's like the Hail Mary. This test says the government's conduct was so, again, this is very important, unfair and outrageous that it violates the due process clause of the fifth or 14th amendment and therefore it would be unjust to convict the defendant. Now, again, defense has to prove this uh, by a preponderance of the evidence, and it's kind of a Hail Mary. It's a really difficult burden to meet. If you look at United States versus Russell uh, in your textbook, 388, and Jacobson v. United States, you can see this kind of play out how it works. Um, unfair and outrageous is, is a very high bar, right? It has to kind of like shock the conscience of a normal person, right? Um, and so, yeah, it, 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 it's rarely met. But United States v. Russell and Jacob Wilson v. United States, um, not only does it talk about how it came to be, but it gives you examples of, of, of just how difficult it is to invoke the due process clause. All right, so just for review, Sherman, when we're talking about entrapment, gave us two tests, the subjective test, which has two prongs, and the objective test, which has a list of prohibited activity. Now, if neither of those are in the defendant's favor, the defendant can invoke a third test, which is the due process clause. And when we say something is outrageous and unfair that the government did, then we're going to say it's entrapment and dismiss the case. Um, that being said, if, if you can prove something is outrageous and unfair, you probably are gonna prove it under one of the other tests. But this is for like, maybe you did have a predis like maybe you really did, like you've had two or three arrests for prostitution. Um, and this time you slow down and you were legitimately trying to ask for directions. Well, we're gonna say, well, you had a predisposition to the crime, right? Um, so if that doesn't work for you and it's not a prohibited activity, then we look at due process and say, look, you went way too far. This is absolutely ridiculous. Um, you made the person commit this crime. So the next lecture, we are going to look at, and we're going to kind of switch gears from um, kind of investigatory parts of, of due process um, to the trial stages, the initial appearance, everything that's really court related and your constitutional rights there. So if you have any questions, as always, feel free to email me. Thank you for listening and I hope you have a great day.